Thanks very much for taking sure. the time and joining us. Uh, to start off with, uh, how, how did you read the quarter for yourself? I think we had a pretty consistent uh, performance in terms of both revenue growth. You know, on a CC, y, uh, YOI basis, we grew almost 15%, which is probably, I would say, the upper quartile for sure. Uh, on a CC QQ basis, we grew about 3%, uh, which I think consistently we've been doing 3 to 4% for six quarters in a row now. So I'm pretty pleased with at least the, the top line growth numbers. Uh, the thing that stood out for us was that our TCB wins have been consistently uh, you know, tracking up. So in FY17, we used to do 60 to 80 million of net new TCB a quarter in our direct business. That number bumped up to about 120 million a quarter last year, FY18. You know, mm. And this year we've tracked, uh, you know, first quarter was 150 plus, second quarter is 200 plus. So I think we are probably 50% higher in terms of deal wins. And that bodes well for the long-term growth of the, of the overall revenue line because that gives you a backlog of business to execute on. On the margins front, I think we've also uh, consistently, uh, you know, tracked higher. Uh, of course, this quarter 20 bps lower on a QOQ basis, but that's because we're feeding growth. And our overall long-term objective really is to continue to grow above market, market being defined as the you know, Indian IT services growth rate. This year seems to be the 79% number. Uh, and if we do that while expanding our operating margin, then I think we are you know, headed in the right direction. So you know, that's kind of the trajectory that we are following, and we are pleased with the, the way the quarter tracked out. Your guidance of 15 to 17% on the operating margin, sure. uh, Despite your wage hikes, uh, this quarter, work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this quarter, I mean, you'll be able to maintain it. Yes, because I think we we started the year with the upper end. You know, we were 16 and a half plus. Uh, we are 16.4 in Q2. So I think from a uh, you know we've created enough of headroom for ourselves to be able to take some of that and put back in the business. Uh, so we still maintained, you know, while we were on the upper end, we maintained the range 15 to 17. We still maintain the range 15 to 17 because we have a lot of operating levers. The best operating lever you have for margin expansion is growth. So as long as you have strong growth, you know, you have the ability to uh, to find ways to improve margin. Pyramid correction, you know, span, um, you know, we have some good tailwind with our ability to price the right services. You know, given that 80% of our deal wins are in new gen services, that does give us the ability to, to do right pricing. And of course, uh, our fixed price percentage has been doing well as well in terms of trend, trending in the right direction. So there are a lot of levers in play for us to continue to expand our operating margin profile. So you would actually continue to grow well, at the same time be able to maintain our better margins as well. You're not doing the get your foot in the door strategy at a lower price and then expand business later on. See, yes, that happens when you're trying to actually play in the commodity services. Right? Given that 80% of our new wins are coming in new gen services, hmm. our ability to actually do right pricing is pretty good. Okay. That's the reason we're not playing the pricing game. We're really playing the value game. Hmm. Uh, and that's pretty evident in the way the numbers have tracked out over the last six quarters. If you look at our, just you know, we are one of the few companies that are happily giving out our average rates onshore and offshore. Ah. Those rates have turned it up pretty pretty healthily over the last six quarters. Actually, I was going to ask that as well. How does this piece shape up over, say, a four or five year period? Because I'm just trying to put uh, the Indian IT services into buckets of uh, periods, right? Sure. So let's say until 2015 or maybe 2013, as the case may be, a lot of commoditized business and therefore wage hikes used to be at par. I was speaking to a large IT company and they said that wage hikes in IT services by and large have been 1-2% CAGR for them. Uh, by and large, except for key personnel. Now, because you are 80% in new gen, would you over the next three or four years, in order to bid businesses and retain that manpower, have to give above average pay hikes? And will that be a concern? I think the trick isn't just about pay hikes. The trick is about the ability to create talent for these new skills. And you have to be able to create net new talent so they're not dependent on just hiring from the market mm -hmm. or just making sure that you know, you're know you paying more to, to retain talent. So I think the ability to create the happy medium between having the right demand in the right areas and finding the ways to fill, fill that demand. I mean, end of the day, our business as an industry exists because of shortage of skills, True. especially in, in quote-unquote niche areas. Huh. So what's niche today will become standardized tomorrow, will become commodities day after tomorrow. Right? So our ability to drive that throughput have the right you know, people strategy, have the right talent strategy in terms of reskilling, all of that feeds back into you know, this, this uh, paradigm. Keep in also, also keep in mind that our current year margins, you know, in context, we are not getting the benefit of, wage, uh, of any currency depreciation this year because we are fully hedged. Yeah. So we have a lot of tailwind that will show up two or three quarters from now. You are working with the rupee depreciating further then? We are working, you know, even at current levels, we are not seeing any benefit because we were fully hashed at about 67.5 okay. for FY19. And then again, you know, it's been publicly declared in our in our disclosure documents as well. So we do have the, that tailwind showing up next year, if, even if the rupee doesn't go anywhere. 
Okay. Because obviously, you're, you know, when you renew hedges, they're coming at, at better rates as we speak. So we do have the ability to take some of that gain and invest back in the business, whether it's for people or sales or, or any other metric that we need to, to focus on. Okay. The other part uh, I want to talk about is, uh, you know, areas where there is a little bit of a concern, particularly on the digital risk side, digital sure. risk business, <laughs> revenues decline 10%. For you and HP, particularly, I mean, it contributes about 27 percent to your overall revenues. Do you see traction picking up there? Because it still continue, does it continue to lose contracts for you? Actually, if you look at it, the whole DXC HP channel has been a fastest growing business for the last six quarters on a YOY basis, right? And some of it was because we had lost significant revenue five years preceding. Uh, once we reset that in 2016, we saw some good growth. But more importantly, I think uh, we are tracking very well above our minimum commitments from there. So there's a, we've turned that into a, what used to be a drag is actually a, a growth engine for us. Underlying, there are four different contracts, right? So there's not just one contract. I don't see the risk of that turning into a drag anytime soon because, as I said, it's, a, it's right now a fastest growing business. We definitely have the ability to, to drive value to them. Uh, we are you know, partnering with them in deals, both on the DXC side as well as on the HP side. Uh, our market share is still fairly low, so I think there is a lot of uh, you know tailwind, and and uh, we find. So what do you expect to right take way. that? Uh, we we actually called for above market growth for FY19, and that's evident even in the run rate. If you just do nothing more, we'll probably grow in high teens, you know, on a YY basis in that business. So, I think the whole HP DXC business sustainability was a big question mark last year. I think six quarters in a row we've we've mm. trended that up. Mm. Uh, you know, if, if there is still some skepticism, I think that can only be good for us because expectation-wise it gives us the ability to yeah. beat it. On the digital risk side, I think, again, we called out in the last quarter that that business is headwinded, given what's happening in the U.S. mortgage business. Uh, we did enter near neighbor, in, you know, segments of services there. We've we stabilized that business, I would say, over the last six quarters or so. Mm -hmm. We called out for a 28 to 30 million quarterly range. We're still within that range. Yes. Uh, so I think, at the very least, I don't think anybody should be surprised that the business isn't a growth driver. I think we, we keep it stable, and we, we've actually driven the margins pretty significantly higher in that business from where it used to be about two years ago. So I think for us right now, that, that business is something that we need to kind of just keep stable. Uh, and while we feed growth <laughs> um, you know some companies some of your peers have been found wanting when they've gone into this whole front to back transformation you seem to have done reasonably well thus far sure. but then as you sit uh, in your chair and look at emphasis not just for the next two quarters but let's say and if it's possible to do that look at it from the next three or four years sure. perspective uh, how do you see growth shaping up and how do you see uh, the emphasis four years out being different if it will be different from what it is right now. So I think we laid out this uh, front to back digital transformation approach about a year and a half ago. Hmm. And the idea was a lot of the traditional technology now sits in the core back office systems. Hmm. They've been built over the last 35, 40 years, 50 years, depending on which industry you talk about. And they're really doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're well optimized, they're high performance systems, they're that's where almost all of our peers and of course, you know, traditionally us have, have played in. But the revolution isn't really sitting there anymore. Because if anything, there's a lot of squeeze going on because nobody wants to spend more money in core systems anymore. Hmm. The real revolution is really in investing in technology in front of the consumer. Right? And that consumer experience, all forms of you know multi multiple interactions powering it with things like voice, AR, VR, uh, having UI that is flexible, you know, why shouldn't the, the UI change based on your mood? Hmm. Uh, that's really where the real investment is happening and that is being, and, and that intermediation between the core and the front end is being done through a cognitive or a data layer. Hmm. So I think we, we called out for a front to back approach, which used to be back to front because core systems used to drive technology. And I think that that flip is starting to happen. A lot of the traditional enterprises are investing hugely in in front of consumers, in, you know, in the consumer-facing tech. Uh, and that's where where I think there's a lot of opportunity. I would say at least for the next three to five years. If I was to kind of future guess a little bit, I think the core will continue to be relevant, hmm. but it'll keep shrinking. That's where the pricing pressure will be. That is where the cut of spend will be. That is where you'll see a lot of transformation. It'll end up becoming a system of record, but not necessarily your core application. The real core will actually sit in the data layer. And if you have the ability to drive that transformation, 
I think we are in for a very long term opportunity for any any company who can do that. Would it need a lot of investments? And and because I'm, I'm sure as you understood this and done this, maybe uh, slightly ahead of some of your other peers in your, in your size, sure. I'm sure others will pick up as well. I think it, it's not so much about the investment because everybody has the technical jobs to do it. Firstly, you have to adopt that approach hmm. because if you still think that the real large deals are in the core, you really don't want to cannibalize that core, and you don't want to go outside of the core in terms of you know new new services. Then you're not going to play in that in in that segment. So how do you counterbalance the the fact that you have you know 80% of your business for the industry sitting in the core? I mean, for us in the direct business, it's, left, it's almost 50% sitting here and 50% outside. This is where the growth is. This is where the traditional money is. So how do you balance this innovator's dilemma? Is really the, really the real question. Yes, there is an element of cannibalization because you have to really apply automation to the core. And that's where your revenue sits today. So how do you, you know, balance that cannibalization with new investments? And risk of lumpiness as well? Uh, not necessarily, because you get into digital programs, they're really long-term programs, they're large programs. Right? But you have to be seen to play in that segment, otherwise you'll actually end up losing. You, know, you won't be seen as a credible player in that segment. Talking about segments, just to uh, extrapolate from that, to where exactly are you uh, looking at being the next big growth driver for you? Which segment? Where are you building capabilities now to make sure, sure that three or four years down the line this is a key contributor to your earnings? So I think from our perspective, uh, the service lines are not going to be any different than what we've been driving. The front-to-back approach and service transformation are the two core pillars of services. Front to and both of them are cloud and cognitive native, right? So you have to be able to use new technologies like cloud computing, and more importantly, apply transformation using automation or analytics to everything. So, small example, uh, maintenance used to be a big service line for all IT services companies, but maintenance shouldn't really be a break fix problem anymore. It should be a predictive analytics problem. Mm -hmm. If you drive the transformation, you're actually going to going to succeed in making that pivot. So that's on the service line side, right? You have to continue to feed new services, new gen services, and cloud and cognitive are the two core pillars there. I think we've also taken the approach of blending these horizontal services with industry verticals. So for us, banking, insurance, logistics, uh, you know, transport, uh, parts of healthcare uh, continue to be large areas of focus. If you blend the horizontal and the, and the vertical, then you have a, a good you know, chance of differentiating yourselves. We've also said we're going to focus on primarily the large Western market. So for us, US, Canada, and parts of Europe continue to be focus areas. So that's, we're very focused. We're not trying to be everything to everybody. You know, it's not a spray and pray approach. It's very, very focused strategy when it comes to verticals, geographies, and of course, service lines. Great. We wish you all the best for all of this and more, Nitin. Thank so Thanks so much for Thank taking you. the time out and being with us in your studios. Congratulations on the deal wins, more importantly, Thanks. and hopefully that continues in the quarters ahead as well. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's Nitin Rakesh uh, of Emphasis with his thoughts.